it's thursday it's justice thursday conversations that we take that we have every thursday and today we're joined by the honorable kennedy bidali he's back in the studio he's been here before he is from the office of the judiciary ombudsman the honorable bidali good morning good morning good to have you again karibu sana uh, you'll tell us about the ombudsman and what you've been doing since the last time you're here how many people are up accessing the ombudsman's office because we are talking about enhancing equitable access to justice if there are people who may not know or understand the reason why we need to have an ombudsman's office in the judiciary so introduce us to that office again yeah thank you thank you for having me once again the ombuds is an office that uh, has its historical uh, background in the scandinavian countries it's an administrator, uh, an office of an administrator who would deal with administrative bottlenecks. Of course, it has evolved over time. And uh, for the judiciary, it's an office that receives, processes, and deals with complaints against all employees of the judiciary. But not just complaints. Uh, we also receive compliments. Uh, we look into administrative bottlenecks and propose solutions. We also have go between the users mm. and the administrators, uh, meeting both to try and find easier ways to make sure that justice is accessed easily and faster. Mm. Yeah, Sounds like for you to do your work, you need to be activated by somebody raising an issue with the office of the ombudsman. If there are no issues being raised, then you sit pretty. Uh, not necessarily. Mm. Uh, yes, we do have a wing that deals with complaints. But we also have another section that deals with compliance. There are lots of rules, regulations, manuals which have to be adhered to. And part of what we do is to ensure adherence to those regulations. So that's not activated by a complaint. Mm. Okay. So uh, we're looking at places where people can bring issues to as the ombudsman. <coughs> what is the nature of some of these um, complaints that come to your desk? I think it informs then further on who can come. So what is the nature of some that you've seen? Yeah, so we, we have several different kinds of, we've categorized them into services. Mm -hmm. As you would expect, the major source of complaint is on delay. Okay. Delay in accessing justice, delay in having a case heard, delay in having a judgment delivered, delay in having a decree uh, issued after judgment is delivered. So it's, it, goes, it cuts across the entire uh, justice process from the moment you file a suit to the moment uh, the case is finalized. So those are the, that's the majority of the complaints that we receive. Mm. And uh, how do we resolve them? Mm. We look in sometimes, uh, unfortunately, some of them fall through the cracks. Mm. You filed a case uh, eight years ago, a date was given. For some reason or another, you didn't attend court and yeah. nobody took action after that. So we try to revive those cases. At least at this time, uh, we have a case track system. Mm. So any matter that has no position, we are able to tell from headquarters and activate the court stations mm. to deal with it. So that uh, really delays is, a, is the major complaint that we deal with. Of course, there are many others. Uh, there are instances where files are not availed on time. Mm. Some people report them as lost. Mm. But uh, it's because of um, the delays within the registries. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there are complaints about uh, a few incident, incidents of uh, misconduct. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, there are brokers sometimes who may come in and uh, pose as judiciary employees. Mm. <laughs> and uh, we deal with those. I'd like you to explain this one to me. <laughs> what would a broker do? I know what a broker would do if I wanted to buy land. But in the judicial system where does a broker fit in what are they brokering <laughs> yeah unfortunately they would just come in uh prey on naive litigants mm -hmm. uh for instance uh bail is a right guaranteed a right. Yes. by the constitution by yes but not everyone has read that and understands that <laughs> so the broker would now come in to tell you that they can facilitate bail mm. but uh it is a right. They have, of course, it doesn't happen to all. They carefully pick their victims and select those who they think may not understand uh, the laws. They look vulnerable. Yeah. Mm. The issue of complaints, 
because you're saying many complaints that come in are about delays when you look back what is the main cause for these delays what is it is it an institutional issue um is it a capacity issue is it uh, a bottleneck issue what what is it that would lead to so many delays such that many of the things that you have to deal with is somebody coming to say i mean my matter is not being resolved as fast as i expected it to yeah, yeah there are a variety of causes uh, let me start with the apex court, the appellate courts. Until recently, when judges were sworn in, there was a shortage. Uh, they ought to be at 30 full capacity. I think there was a time there were only 17 judges in that court. Mm. The caseload has not changed, but the numbers are reduced by half. Naturally, there's going to be a delay mm. in the high court. So this is the same situation that was in the... This, this was in the court of appeal. In the high court, it's the same. It's a capacity issue. Magistracy too, it's a capacity issue. Mm. Um, I think you must have seen in, in uh, the papers about two weeks ago an advertisement for 60 additional judicial officers. This is driven, this information is driven by data. Mm. How many judicial officers do we need on the ground? Mm. They are needed as soon as yesterday. Mm. And that's why I think the commission is uh, fast tracking the process of hiring and recruitment. But uh, other than capacity, we also had a, a few systemic issues. Mm. Judiciary was by far and large manual. Mm. So you can imagine you have this very lengthy case, you appear before a judge or magistrate, and the proceedings have to be taken down by hand. Uh, that's time consuming. It's tiring for the magistrate, it's tiring for the judge. Mm. If you now go to Milimani, quite a few courts will actually run their session when the judicial officer does not have a pen. So that makes the process faster. Mm. Yeah. But then there are those it's there's a capacity issue, there's an institutional issue. Is there a process issue? Because not everybody who had a case lodged before the Court of Appeal in twenty twenty is complaining. Yeah. Not all cases that are lodged in twenty twenty are delayed. So are there instances where you find maybe there's a misprioritization of cases or maybe there's um i don't know in terms of judging and prioritizing cases some judicial officers or the registry misses out on some issues i, I don't think that i would say that there are process issues mm. uh there are legal requirements uh for instance if you're filing a simple claim for a personal injury you have to file a pleading and then wait, serve the other side, wait for a couple of days. Mm. Once they uh, respond to it again, you have to wait for a couple of days before mm. you go for what they call directions and so on and so forth. Mm. So, and this is the requirement of the civil procedure. So, as far as those, uh, uh, admit, those requirements are concerned, really it's not about process. It's about compliance with the law. Uh -huh. But... It's not all lost. You've heard of the small claims court. Yeah. Mm. Essentially, although the, it has certain limitations because of pecuniary jurisdiction, nothing more than a million. However, you realize that the timelines in that court mm. are very short from the date of filing to the date of judgment. Mm. And uh, this is sort of a fast track civil suit mm. because uh, there is recognition that in the main uh, courts, mm. there are far more processes to be adhered to mm. and the timelines are longer but in the small claims court you realize that uh, you could actually have a judgment 60 days from the date of filing mm. okay mm. do you find it a challenge though then straddling between the expectations of the users who may come to complain and the reality on the ground in terms of the judiciary because of some things that you've spoken about now the need for more judicial officers the time that caseloads take brokers who come and mess things up so here you are saying you know what users are complaining about however being on the inside as it were you see the challenges so how then do you balance between the two yeah uh really brokers is is a very minor issue issue yeah. uh, we really don't don't have a problem with that in many courts if and when they appear they are dealt with mm. and uh, importantly is the online system mm. of filing cases in several courts uh, 
And uh, when you're filing online from the comfort of your house, where does the broker come in? Mm. Yeah, sure. We, we are sort of locking out that segment. Uh, for the challenges that uh, we, the expectations, you talked about the expectations of our users, as you would expect if you appeared before court today, you would want your judgment tomorrow. Yeah. So the expectation is that that uh, case will be fast tracked, it will be had very quickly. Mm. But it's not always possible because of the capacity issues and uh, in the big cities because of the numbers. And this is why you'll see, uh, we had told you about this Mahakama Popote mm. initiative. It's partly to deal with that bottleneck of capacity within the major cities and the lack of sufficient numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one another issue um, that has crept up quite heavily in the past few years has been that of lawyers, attorneys who represent individuals obtaining money from them and then not, number one, filing their cases, not going ahead to do what they do, what they should be doing, as well as receiving rewards on their behalf and then running away with them. Does that come to your desk? Uh, no, no. Uh, for the judiciary ombudsman, mm. really you have to be an employee of the judiciary. You know, yeah. But there's a very elaborate process to deal with mm. the issue you're raising through the Advocates Complaints Commission. Yeah. They have a disciplinary council. Those issues are taken to put that body, the LSK. Yeah. Yeah. While we're on that same topic, mm. there is, um, for lack of a better expression, the term that is often used is ambulance chasing. Lawyers who present themselves as acting for people who are involved in accidents, mm. of one nature or the other. Mm. And along these lines of seeking justice, many complaints arise. Do these complaints arrive at your desk? No, no. Once again, that's to do with advocates. Uh, they are not uh, judiciary employees. Uh, and ambulance chasing, really, it's the term, as we know it, is where there's an accident and there are lots of people struggling to yes. be the ones representing the victims in that accident. Uh, that's how they coined it. But after an accident, there should be an ambulance to take people to hospital. Mm. Behind the ambulance, <laughs> the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So those really, that's those are not employees of the judiciary. Those go to so the LSK. Those go to the law society. Of okay. Kenya. Yeah. Now, if indeed a case went before a judge of a similar nature, I'm still on this matter of ambulance chasing, and one felt that the judgment that was pronounced did not suit their purposes would they then come to you or to your office no no if uh, in the event of being dissatisfied mm. by a decision of a court the the constitution our laws provide for the perfect solution the appellate court process mm. and uh, that's the only way mm. uh, no merit-based uh, complaint comes to the judiciary ombudsman's office because those uh, if you are aggrieved then you have to appeal. Uh, if a court pronounces itself on a decision and gives the reasons why, really it's the, it's the only way is through the appellate process. We deal with it if, for instance, uh, the law provides that judgments shall be delivered in 60 days. Uh, in the small claims court, it's uh, uh, probably shorter. Mm. And then that does not happen without an explanation. Then because, it comes to you. Because even when the judgment delays, uh, the law provides for leeway, the judicial officer judge can render an explanation mm -hmm. and deal with it. But if none is forthcoming, then that becomes administrative. Okay. Now let me ask this question because it has been in the back of my mind for some time mm -hmm. and it's just as well that you're here. Mm -hmm. There was an office that was proposed, there's discussion around it, the Office of the Public Defender. If such an office existed, would it be a complementary office to your office or would it be an office that is completely separate from yours dealing with completely different matters? Uh, I think it, the way I know the public defender's office proposal, it would be completely different mm. from the ombudsman's office. The closest, uh, which is actually in existence to the ombuds and which is an office that oversees all ombudsmen from various government institutions, is the Commission on Administrative Justice. Justice. That is the public ombudsman, really. Mm -hmm. We are more or less under the umbrella of the CAJ. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So what would the public defender be doing? Well, I don't know the uh, how Mr. Sitian <laughs> researched it. Uh, in my view, mm. uh, that would be an office that would be probably be more aligned to the uh, Attorney General, mm. probably, not the judiciary. Not the judiciary. Yeah. Okay. You see why I asked the question? Mm. It's because, you see, the assumption is that when somebody has a complaint, the complaints would be, no, let me reverse it. The offices that are set up are, in my mind, categorized to enable the complainant to channel whatever issue they have to the appropriate office. Now, sometimes one may not be happy with the offices that are in place. I'm going to give an example of what I mean. Mm. If I go to a magistrate's court and I'm unhappy and you tell me to go to a high court, and I go there, I'm unhappy. You keep telling me to keep going to a higher court. I'm unhappy with the court system. <coughs> okay? So if I'm happy with the court system, telling me to go to yet another court, you're not helping me at all. Because as far as I'm concerned, it is the same court system. What, what sort of grievance would that be if, if you're unhappy with the court? Uh, because, you see, if it's based on a matter before a court, really it's about it, the facts, the evidence, and interpretation of the law. Hmm. And uh, the constitution with finality says, mm. on this issue, if you are aggrieved, mm. this is the court. Actually, you've gotten to the heart of the matter. You see, <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is yeah. not what we normally deal with. You see, you are saying normalcy dictates that if you are unhappy with this lower court, if you go to a higher court, the listening and the processes would perhaps look at issues that were not looked at previously. If you're not happy with the high court, then you go to uh, a three bench is three judge three judge bench yeah, thank you three judge appeal. bench yes, yes. now mm -hmm. there are more years listening to this than the previous one isn't it yes now i am envisioning a situation where i don't like the court processes okay but i want somebody with the knowledge of the law to handle this matter now when you say you have the office of the ombudsman i understand the issue of complaints and what have you when we talk about the theoretical office of the public defender, again, the name suggests when the public has, I being the public, I have an issue, that is the person I would go to because they understand the law and they're able to interpret it in a way that may suit my purposes. I'm merely asking the question, of the many avenues that an individual in this country has to seeking a matter redressed for them, a matter of the law, okay? I'm asking the question, do we have enough avenues for that to happen that's really what i'm asking yeah well if you bring in the public defender angle really uh it envisaged more than what the ombudsman does mm. uh, and uh, in terms of you talked about being unhappy with the court processes mm. i think there's a way around it mm. uh you see there's a requirement in terms of the court processes to have all courts have court users committee, a leadership and management committee, where the court processes can be discussed at that court level. Mm. And uh, then we have, all this is under the auspices of the National Council on Administration of Justice, mm. which looks at the entire process in the entire justice chain, not just the judiciary. Mm. Mm. Uh, you may be unhappy about court processes, but you may be unhappy about the role of the police mm. during investigations. Mm. The DPP during prosecution or any other investigator or the court during adjudication so that is another body that's another avenue where grievances from the court stations through the court users committee can be escalated to the national council this is a council where all leaders in the justice chain sit and deliberate on the issues before them so uh, in my understanding that would be the best avenue to deal with court processes an individual who's dissatisfied with court processes if it's however on the merits and if it's on the facts and the evidence before a court mm. really the constitution that binds us provides for the appellate court process there is no other way if it's on the book. Uh, essentially, I'm stuck with the courts. <laughs> <laughs> Your public defender is not coming just yet. No. <laughs> Even de getting stuck with the court, I think by just by hearing, if you go to the court users committee and you say, I am unhappy with the process because what you are unhappy with is not necessarily justice, 
is the process mm -hmm. like, like i heard you say so you can address the issue of process from the court users committee but also honorable bidali if he can come directly to you and say i'm unhappy with the process can you guide does the can the office of the ombudsman take that issue and say this is feedback uh, from a user yes yes we do mm -hmm. and we would now take it up from that aspect that uh, this is a court user dissatisfied with the process mm. we deal with administrative processes mm. but to find a solution i do not want to be sitting in the dock it's just because i'm an accused person i'd like to sit elsewhere i want to sit there with the, with the lawyers yes we would take it up but uh, you see this may entail uh, changing uh, manuals directions practice yes. it would still have to go through the same channel very good you've heard of before you change any manual or mm. come up with any regulation, there must be numerous steps, mm. stakeholder engagement, public participation, and so mm. on and so forth. So all those proposed, uh, proposed changes to the processes are channeled through that avenue. I think the important point is that you, you can voice your grievance, right? What if somebody has a complaint about a judicial officer? This is the conduct of a magistrate, Uyalin Alin Tukana. Uh, can you say hot air in court? Can they come to you? Yes, that's within our mandate. Okay. Any complaints on uh, uh, a breach of any of the regulations, a breach of the code of conduct, a breach of any of the laws that govern our court operations, mm. those are within our mandate. Okay. Mm. Do you find that conflict... I mean, conflict of interest, does it ever play here? I think of um, the Employee and Labor Relations Court, right? Yes. And having a conversation with them, you know, you, you can almost hear as though in most cases the employee is taken care of. And we can see that from the judgments that are made. And, we, you know, we're also all often told that, look, from the judgments, we can then deduce that by the time an employee brings a case before the court, you'll find that their grievances then usually are heard in their favor. Unless there's something that cannot be proven, cannot be dealt with. Do you find that that conflict will come here? Because these are judicial officers that bring about complaints. Do you find that you most times will deal with the case and it goes in favor of the one who is complaining? Uh, there's a very, there are very clear practice directions on how to deal with conflicts. Mm. Uh, if, for instance, there's a company uh, that's having a litigation before a court and the presiding officer, the judge or magistrate is a shareholder or has some other interest in that company, uh, the practice is that they do, rec uh, they do declare that conflict mm. and recuse themselves. Okay. from handling that matter any further in terms of employees i guess you mean the employees of the judiciary who appear before the yes. employment and labor relations court i mean where else can they go it's mm. the only court they are employees they have the same protections of the law they have the same rights as all other employees and uh, uh, I, I'm not so sure of the source of the statistics that the, it's often ruled in their favor, mm. but I've read a few decisions mm. where the employees got judgments in their favor. Mm. And uh, if, you, if you follow that history, you'll see that actually those grievances went, most of them, mm. went through the appellate court processes. Oh, really? Some okay. of them were actually determined by the Supreme Court. Mm. So, if the decisions are coming out in the employee's favor. It is the law. Mm. It is not the court. The courts are only interpreting what the law provides. Mm. And uh, quite a few of them, uh, it's very interesting if you read uh, that compendium of cases, quite a few of them fault the processes used. And those processes are anchored in law. Mm -hmm. So if any employer breaches any of those processes, of course the courts will rule against uh, the employer. Yeah. Mm. But... Uh, for the judiciary employees appearing before the same judiciary, there has never been an issue of conflict. Mm. Never. Uh, well, to our knowledge, there's no, there's been perception no perception-wise, maybe, but in reality, no. Well, perception. This is a judiciary employee going yeah. before another judiciary employee. Yeah. 
perception perhaps i'm sure you've but, heard this i mean you you've heard this before where people say oh, of course i mean it's going under the same system the system is going to protect one of their own uh you see this is the irony of it mm. uh when there can be no uh, well we've not heard of those perceptions because when a judiciary employee goes before the employment and labor relations court and uh, has sued the employer, the employer. So the it's the judiciary employee and the judiciary itself. Uh -huh. So really, uh, we, we don't have that perception in those kind of cases. Yeah. But uh, they are likely to occur in uh, many other cases mm. where, uh, for instance, uh, a member of a tribunal appearing before the court, I think we've handled one or two, yeah. mm. and uh, where there was that perception. But on processing the complaints, it was about the merits of the case. Mm. And that was referred to the appellate court process. Who watches the watchman? If I have a complaint against the ombudsman of the judiciary, who do I go to? You escalate it uh, all the way to the chief justice of so, the republic. So how do I do that? Uh, just by, you see, in uh, the office of the is, ombudsman, I know I can come in with a complaint and I'll leave it there and it'll be taken up and you yeah. have a responsibility to do it, an obligation to do it. So if I have a complaint against the, any officer in the office of the ombudsman, how do I deal with that? The ombudsman, like nearly all employees, are under performance contracting. We fail to meet any of our targets. You just escalate it. How? It's as simple, as easy as an email, a tweet, anything. Um, the, the office of the CJ is accessible through all those channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, let me talk to the ombudsman and ask this question. Mm. We refer cases to higher courts. Now, do we have within our constitution, our laws, anything, any process that enables um, a consumer of our judicial processes the opportunity to ask a court to review its ruling? Yes, there is. A, those are statutory provisions uh, where you can go before the same court to review. Uh, sometimes the court can do that on its own motion. During calculations of the general damages, uh, there was a miscalculation and you feel that that ought to be corrected. If it's an error apparent, that there's a statutory uh, the law enables the courts to make that correction and enables the litigants to go back to the same court requesting for a review. It's actually a formal application before mm -hmm. the court. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know where I'm going with this one? Mm. There's something that has been in our landscape for the longest time with, re with regards to the 2022 elections. Is it possible for someone to have gone between the, to the Supreme Court and say, could you review this ruling of yours? No, the, the Supreme Court has its own rules. <laughs> so you would have to gain access. You, you don't just have access to the Supreme Court at the first instance mm. unless it's a presidential petition. Mm. And then all other appeals have to satisfy certain criteria. So if you satisfy that, you have access to the Supreme Court. Mm. But you have to satisfy that criteria that's set out. Mm. Mm. What's Mahakama Popote? Just as the name suggests, mm. it's a court everywhere. Uh, it's a court that leverages on technology uh, to ensure that there is equitable uh, distribution of work and uh, access to justice. That is really the concept behind Mahakama Popote. Mm -hmm. uh, let me break it down this way. We have, uh, the, there's a requirement of the law, for instance, to have high courts in every county. Mm. Uh, we are required to have magistrates spread out to all parts of the country to enable access to justice. Mm. So take the example of the judicial officer who's sitting in Kakuma or sitting in Lodwa. Mm -hmm. uh, the sort of disputes that uh, go before that judicial officer. We require that judicial officer to be there because the people of Kakuma, the people of Lodwa, the people of Mandera need access to that justice. Yeah. And then uh, you look at the s disputes in terms of uh, numbers. Let's talk numbers now. Mm. The disputes 
personal injury claims before a court in Mandera mm. uh, in a year. Would you estimate about how many would be there? Personal injury claims. Mm. Resulting in an accident or... Uh, and then do that comparison. Or shooting. Yeah. Well, yeah, shooting that criminal. <laughs> okay. So it's like that from accident, from road accident, from... Yes, like any, any personal any, injury claim. Right. They would, so, that, they would not be that many. Not many. Yeah. Mm. So what about in uh, a court in Kakuma or Lodua? They w then do that. Comp they are there. Mm. But they now exist, compare yeah. that mm. with a judicial officer sitting in Nakuru or Mombasa. All right. Or right here in Melimani. Mm. So the numbers would, be, would vary so much. Yeah. Uh, to the extent that on average, for instance, in the past, in six months of the year 2022, the last six months, on average in Milimani, each judicial officer handled about 3,400 cases. Per judicial One. officer? Each. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at those returns. Mm. And uh, in Mombasa, the number was slightly lower about 2,200, 2,300 cases mm -hmm. uh, for the last six months of the year 2022. Uh, so compare these numbers with the ju same judicial officers, same facilities, same qualifications, mm. same pay, sitting in Kakuma. Mm. Uh, the numbers would be much lower. So others, you require that judicial officer to be in Kakuma. Mm. Uh, but that judicial officer has more judicial time to spare as compared to the one who's sitting in Mombasa law courts yeah. or in Akuru mm -hmm. or in any busy commercial hub. The numbers would be higher. So this Mahakama Popote was uh, actually driven by data. And uh, it's the data that I'm just sharing mm -hmm. that uh, the numbers in the commercial hubs were much higher. And uh, so what the judiciary now did is just to leverage on ICT. Uh, COVID had brought virtual courts mm. unto us. And uh, when we dealt with COVID, we were not going to let go of the virtual courts. Yeah. So it is very likely that you have a matter in Milimani Commercial Court and the Chief Justice has appointed judicial officers under this initiative to hear matters and posted judicial officers at the Milimani court. Mm. But when you appear in the morning, uh, you will be before a judicial officer, but uh, he may not be physically sitting in Milimani. Mm. And your Mahakama will be Popote. Mm. It could be in Kakuma, it could be in Lodwa. It's a virtual court. It's a virtual court. So the judicial officer who could be assigned to this particular case does not necessarily have to be one who's posted in Nairobi. No, no, for this purpose and so that um, for the requirement of the law, mm -hmm. when they are handling this matter under this initiative, they are posted and instructed by the Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, but previously, before the, virtual, the advent of virtual courts, what would happen is that the judges or judicial officers, whenever a court is overwhelmed, they would travel to that court. Yeah. And hear matters for a week, a month, just to bring the numbers down. Mm -hmm. To probably what we expect uh, the national average mm. but the difference now is that the judicial officers don't travel they simply have the credentials they log into our virtual courts and they're able to determine matters in any event if you had a case in milimani you would not go there your advocate would not go there 90 percent of the cases your advocate if you wanted to hear the case you'd have to log in mm. or go to your advocates chambers mm. So you can still do the same. Um, go to the advocates' chambers, follow your case, testify virtually. Okay, so let me ask the question again. Mm -hmm. Because you gave us the example of the judicial officer who's posted in Kakuma, yeah. who may have a little bit more judicial time. Uh, and then there's another one who's in Mombasa, who's really swamped. Can the judicial officer sitting in Kakuma log on and hear a matter that's before a court in Mombasa. So this is, uh, this is how uh, the courts operate on this in, under this initiative. Mm. The 
judicial officer in Mombasa, there's a head of station there, yeah. who would assign matters to the judicial officers working under her. Yeah. Now, that base is expanded to include this other judicial officer who may not physically be there, but could be sitting at another court station, but under this initiative has instructions to uh, ease the backlog of Mombasa. So when you have a pool of five sitting in your court, mm -hmm. under this initiative, when you go to your virtual allocation diary, you will see 10. Okay. Yeah. The only limitation now is that the judicial officers who are virtual will not, for instance, hear criminal cases. Because in some instances, the criminal cases, the witnesses have documents. Uh, some of them, you need to see the demeanors before mm -hmm. you make a determination. However, needs to be present. yes, okay. it, it, the accused person needs to be present. Mm. But in civil cases, mm. even the same court in Mombasa does not physically see the litigants. Mm. They see them virtually. So it's the same thing that the court in Kakuma will see. Uh, the virtual defendant who can testify, who the documents generally will be produced during directions. So if there's any reference to any exhibit, it's already there in the virtual court file. Yeah. Mm. So that's the concept behind Mahakama Popote. How have you found the response to this so far? One well, from the court, uh, practitioners themselves, and from the users of the court. You see, I started, uh, you asked me the sort of the prevalent complaints we deal with. That's, mm. that's delay. Mm. Uh, and you go to Milimani Commercial Courts, you have this urgent matter according to you it's urgent you need that claim settled mm. but because of capacity the diary at milimani only allows you to be heard in the month of october yeah. or november yeah. yeah because this a judicial officer can only hear so much mm. so under this initiative uh when the diary at milimani had closed at october space was found in another diary mm. and therefore that matter can now be heard in the month of June. Mm. And if it's virtual, the statistics show that the matters move faster. Mm -hmm. So what is the reaction to the litigant? I mean, I, had, I could have waited till October, but in June I have a hearing date. Yeah. Probably in July I have a judgment. So of course the reaction is very positive the, for the litigants. Uh, but of course, if your instructions were go in and delay it as long as possible we may lose this claim mm. <laughs> you may not be too amused mm. but uh, but we have a system of ensuring that even if uh, your instructions are to cause delay mm. you know we have our the daily returns so the adjournments would just pop up every time um, we're doing our statistics so that can be taken care of if, if your instructions were to delay. Yeah. But the reaction from the litigants, the advocates, has been very positive. We're actually uh, rolling it out to more courts mm. because the data shows that uh, the work distribution, because of the requirement to have courts in all counties, the commercial disputes are not equally spread out. Yeah, of course. So there'd be more in the bigger cities of course. and less in the sub-counties. So we can have the judicial officers sit in the counties, but, but here, still here the, matter the matters in the, in the main hubs. What we'd like to do next is actually start getting the feedback from the court users, right? So because there's all this, you know, digitization of uh, processes in the judiciary and the efficiency that it's bringing, and we've heard from you, you've heard from the registrars, and we heard from ICT personnel. Next, it's now important to start hearing from the people. Let the people say, yeah, in fact, this is what had happened before, and this is how this speeded up my access to justice. But we thank you very much, Ban Ombudsman, for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Again. Come again soon. Asante. It was a pleasure yes. coming in, and thank you all for hosting me. The Honorable Kennedy Bidali is the Judiciary Ombudsman. He's been our guest this morning. He's told us about Mahakama Popote and how it's enhancing equitable access to justice.